How is God the source or ground of morality? Is something moral because God says it is? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and we're exploring some questions that you send in to the website, reasonablefaith.org. These are some of the most compelling questions that people ask, and Dr. Craig is addressing them on this podcast. You can get many resources, including articles, debates, audio, video, interactive forums, these podcasts, and Dr. Craig's Defenders class, all available at our website, reasonablefaith.org. We are looking at some great questions at the website, reasonablefaith.org, Dr. William Lane Craig's website. And there are questions that people submit that Dr. Craig chooses from time to time to answer. There's a good one here, Dr. Craig, on how God can be the ground of morality or moral values. Let's talk about this question. We've dealt with this a lot. Your articles deal with this. It comes out in your debates uh, quite often. But it asks how God can be the ground of morality, can somehow ground moral values. Well, I think of God as the embodiment of the moral good. He is the paradigm of goodness. He defines what goodness is. Think by way of analogy of um, judging a music in terms of being high fidelity. We, we used to hear the term that a recording was high fidelity, which meant that it approximated to the sound of a live orchestra. Um, But a a live orchestra wouldn't itself be high fidelity because it doesn't have anything to approximate to. It is the standard. Well, in the same way, moral values are defined by God. He is the standard of, of goodness. His character is the paradigm of goodness. And then whether or not our actions are good or bad will be based upon how faithful they are to the standard, whether they are morally high fidelity or not, or whether they fall away from the standard and are therefore evil. So God, in his moral nature, is the paradigm of goodness. He is by nature essentially good, loving, kind, faithful, just, loyal, truthful, and so forth. So I see moral values as defined paradigmatically in God, that is that God is the standard. Then that moral nature issues in divine commandments to us. It is out of that nature that God commands us that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind and so forth. And these moral commandments then constitute our moral duties. This is the source of moral obligation for us, that we are commanded by God, the paradigm of goodness, to do certain things. So we can distinguish between values and duties in this way. Values concern the moral worth of something, whether it's good or bad. Duties concern whether something is obligatory for us, whether it's right or wrong. And I see moral duties as rooted in the commandments, moral values as rooted in the nature of God. Dr. Craig, the critic will often say that morals are subjective, and even if they're somehow grounded in God, that they're still subjective because they're subject to him and Mm -hmm. what he thinks is moral and so Mm -hmm. on. How does what you just said escape that subjectivity of moral values within God? Great question. If moral values were simply rooted in the divine will, if God just made up what is right and wrong arbitrarily, then I would agree with you. That would be the ultimate in subjectivity. Moral values would just be arbitrary declarations of God. Uh, And that position has a name. It's called voluntarism. Voluntarism would be the view that moral values are rooted in the will of God and that the will of God just decides what's good and evil, right and wrong. The view that I've laid out is quite different than that. because well, People say, God has his opinion, I have mine. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, now the, the view I've laid out is quite different from that because it says that moral values are not rooted in the divine will. His commands to us are expressions of his will, but these are rooted in the divine nature, in his essential moral 
properties like justice, kindness, compassion, truthfulness, and so forth. And those aren't arbitrary. Those can't be changed. Those are logically necessary and therefore exist in all possible worlds. There is no possible world in which God lacks these properties so and further, does not exist. So for further study, we could uh, contrast volunteerism and essentialism? You know, it's interesting. I, I don't know that the na- that the, this view that I've laid out has a name. It, it's, a, it's a form of divine command morality, but I suppose you could call it essentialism mm-hmm. uh, as mm-hmm. opposed to voluntarism. Okay. And I think this is interesting, Kevin, because the very charge that you made is made in the uh, recent uh, atheist handbook called The Cambridge Companion to Atheism that has an article in there by David Brink attacking the moral argument for God's existence. Brink is an eminent ethicist, and yet when you read his critique of theistic ethics, the only version he knows is voluntarism. That's all he knows, and, and he attacks that. He knows nothing of the work of people like Robert Adams, William Alston, Philip Quinn, and others defending the sort of divine command essentialism that I've just laid out to you. So that, in effect, he's attacking a straw man. I don't know any contemporary Christian philosopher who defends voluntarism. So there are various divine command theories, and voluntarism would be one divine command theory yes. that, is, that is pretty vulnerable to attack. Yeah, I think it is unacceptable because, as you say, it is ultimately subjectivism, really, Mm -hmm. because God just makes these things up. Since God is ultimate, since he's ontologically ultimate, Mm -hmm. it means his very being is is ultimate. He is the standard and so on. You wouldn't want to say that God is subject to his own nature because God isn't subject to anything. What could you say, that he's just... uh, consistent with it or in keeping yes, with Yes, right, that he, he is consistent with his own nature. Remember, it is his nature. It's not as there's something outside God that compels him to act in a certain way. Rather, this is just the way God is. It's, it's who he is. Does this split what's commonly known as Euthyphro's dilemma? Because I run into it on websites a lot. And uh, that is an ancient dilemma from Plato. William Alston, a great Christian philosopher who was at Syracuse University, wrote an article in which he laid out this version of divine command theory, and the title of the article was, What Euthyphro Should Have Said. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Uh, So that when uh, Socrates asked him, is something good because the gods will it, or do the gods will it because it is good, what Euthyphro should have said is that the gods will it because they are good, or he is good, uh, if you put it in the context of monotheism. So that's the, the, the correct answer. It's, it's a third alternative that splits the horns of the dilemma. God wills it because he is good. He is the paradigm of moral value. What you're saying seems to account for why moral values are objective. Yes, I think that this is a form of moral objectivism, just as much as Platonism is. I mean, what what Christian theologians did when they read Plato was they took what Plato called the good, which was a sort of abstract ideal that was the determinant or the standard of moral value. And they said, well, there isn't any such abstract entity as the good. What Plato is really talking about is God's nature. So they took the good and in essence made it the nature of God, and thereby have the same sort of objectivism that Platonic ethics did. What can we learn from that? Mm. They took Plato, they took his insights, and applied them to the truth of Christianity. Exactly. It's, it, they baptized Plato. <laughs> and this is the common pattern of the early church fathers. They didn't just reject Greek philosophy wholesale. But wherever they could, they appropriated its insights in the service of Christian theology. And so in discussions of the doctrine of the Trinity, the incarnation, the attributes of God, Christianity owes a tremendous debt to Greek philosophy in terms of the concepts that are employed in formulating those doctrines. tell you what's hard and what keeps me up at night sometimes, Bill, and that is moral values are real, they're objective. But they're not like a gas that you 
run into. <laughs> They're not hanging suspended somehow, but yet how do they exist then? I think that you're right. They don't exist on their own. That was Plato's view, that they exist as sort of abstract objects. There's such a thing as justice yeah. or greed or vice or uh, self-sacrifice. Even if there were no people, there would be these sort of values that just sort of exist out there. That, that's I, the view. That was yeah, the pl- that was, that platonic was view. Plato, platonic view. But on the Christian view, moral goods exist as properties of God. So they would exist in the same sense that the length of a meter bar exists. Not There isn't some sort of abstract thing called the length that exists on its own, but it's a property of the meter bar that's there in, in Paris and the Bureau of Measures and Weights. And the length of the bar is the property of the bar itself. And the meter was the paradigm for what a meter was. The meter was the length of that bar. And obviously when I said uh, they're not hanging around like some kind of gas and then you run into them and know what to do, a, a gas would be a material thing. Sure. And these are, well, they're, they're immaterial. Right. On Plato's view, these would be what are called abstract objects, which means that they are causally impotent. They, they don't impact anything causally. And I think for Plato, they would exist beyond space and time uh, rather than in the in the space-time universe. Many philosophers think that mathematical entities exist in this way, numbers and sets and so forth. But again, Christians typically took these abstract entities and they internalized them into God and made them divine ideas. They made them the ideas of God. Okay. So in a sense, they're platonic. They're forms that just exist, but... Uh, they're they're anchored in God rather than just brute facts or furniture of the universe. Yes, I, I would resist the idea of saying they're abstract objects because it's not as though God creates these things and that they exist external to him. They are just his ideas, or in the case of moral values, they're just his moral properties. They're just the uh, the way he is. He and, is good. He is loving. He's just. He's kind. And they get to us simply by reflecting on them, it seems. You're talking now about how do we know them? Yeah, how do we know them? How Um, do we discover them? Since we we don't determine them, how then do we discover them? Well, the Bible says in Romans 1 and 2 that God has written his moral law on the hearts of all men so that even those who do not have the Bible do by nature the things that the law requires So there is a kind of innate moral sense, I think, that we have in virtue of being created in God's image. Well, we call it uh, intuitive awareness. We know them intuitively. That that would be one way, I think, that you could call it. And then other values that are not so intuitively obvious would be communicated to us by divine revelation. Okay. I'm pursuing this because uh, a guy really tried to trip me up on all this the other day. He was Mm -hmm. really trying to ask me, how these objective moral values exist, even if they're grounded in God and so forth. And uh, it, 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 it takes a while of dialogue to, yeah. to talk about platonic forms <laughs> and uh, abstract yeah. and, and things like that. Well, when so. you think about it, why is it any more difficult to think that the compassion of God exists than to think that the omnipotence of God exists? Or the timelessness of God exists. I don't see the difference. They're they're just properties of God, but the one is a moral property, and the others are non-moral properties. Things like omnipotence and timelessness aren't moral properties, but that's how they exist in the same way that any of the properties of God exist. They're just ways God is. And morals are properties of persons. I mean, a, a rock doesn't right. contain moral properties, or a right. star, or cosmic dust, or, or even a, uh, a parakeet. So they're, they're very, they're personal. Right, they're person-dependent, and I think it's in virtue of being persons, as God is personal, that we have intrinsic moral value, too. And that's why a single person is more valuable than the entire material universe put together, which is an awesome thought. Because only persons have intrinsic moral value. Things have extrinsic value in that they can serve 
the purposes of persons. A hammer can help me to build a house. Money can help me to buy food. These things are extrinsically valuable in that they serve as means to ends. But persons are ends in themselves. They are intrinsically valuable, not just extrinsically valuable as means to be used for some end. And so, as Augustine said, we should love people and use things. But so often, we do just the opposite. Mm, That's an indictment on us all. It really is. The skeptic will say, well, if moral values are objective, then why doesn't everybody recognize them and agree on moral values? Why are there such conflicts between pro-life and pro-choice and and things like that? Well, I think to say that moral values are objective is not to say that they're always clear. Certainly there can be areas of gray. Some things are clearly right or, or clearly wrong, but In between, there can certainly be difficult moral questions that are hard to discern what's right and wrong. To say that there are objective values and duties is to say that in any moral situation that you find yourself in, there is a right thing to do and there's a bad thing or a wrong thing to do. But it's not to say that that's always easy to discern. So we mustn't confuse epistemology, which is how you know moral values and duties, with ontology, which is the reality of the moral values and duties. I'm not making a claim that because these things objectively exist that they're always easy to discern. We can misapply them, even though they're objective. We can do the wrong thing. Perhaps even though moral values are objective, we sometimes subjectively apply them. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, this is what sin is. Sin says that we're fallen in our nature, and therefore we love wickedness and unrighteousness rather than righteousness. We're bent in upon ourselves and pursue our own selfish interests. And so it's not surprising that when you look out at the world, you find cultures that are deeply warped and and evil. One thinks of apartheid in South Africa or of um, uh, Nazi Germany or in uh, dictatorial societies and cultures like Marxist or communist nations, or even in materialistic, consumer-driven Western nations. It's not surprising, in virtue of people's sinfulness, that we would see entire cultures infected with evil and, and existing in a morally fallen way. So the objectivity of moral values doesn't mean that everybody follows them. Does it, however, account for why people who don't even believe in God or claim not to believe in God can be good or do the good thing or recognize right and wrong? Exactly. If if there were no God, I think there would be no objective moral values. Everything would then be simply subjective. The moral values would be the byproduct of socio-biological pressures upon humanity, just as a troop of baboons will exhibit Uh, cooperative behavior because it helps them to survive. So human beings have evolved a kind of herd morality that helps them to get along in the struggle for survival. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, that sort of thing. So if there is no God, it seems to me that there really is no objective right and wrong, good and evil. Everything is morally indifferent. But if there is a God, then even the atheist's life is characterized by good and evil, right and wrong, whether he believes it or not, because these things are not dependent upon human opinion. A skeptic once accused me of saying, when I tried to show that morals are objective and that they're grounded in God and in his nature and so on, that if I didn't believe in God, or that I somehow tomorrow came to believe that God didn't exist, would that mean that I would go out and begin raping and pillaging? And he said, if you answer no, that means that you don't need God to keep you from doing those things. Would you suddenly transform into a barbarian if you came to think that God didn't exist tomorrow? That's to misunderstand the argument. The argument isn't that because of the existence of God, we're constrained in our moral behavior. The argument is that in the absence of God, the moral behavior that we exhibit is not really good. It's just illusory. So if one came to believe that God does not exist, as many apostate Christians have, 
they don't immediately become barbarians and so forth, but it would mean that the moral behavior that they continue to pursue isn't really right or wrong if if there is no God, if they were right. Now, I, I think there is a God, so it is still good and right, but if God doesn't exist and one came to the realization that he doesn't exist, you might still, as a result of societal pressures, continue to live the way you always have, but there wouldn't be any right or wrong about it any more than there was when you were under the illusion that God did exist. In other words, it's it's not about belief in God. It's about whether or not there is a God. Does it erode morality for a society to move toward disbelief in God? That is a really, really good question that I think only a sociologist and not a philosopher could answer. Certainly, Kevin, when you look at nations that have been atheistic, like Albania and the Soviet Union and communist China, their moral record is absolutely appalling. It it really is frightening. And you can't help but wonder if atheism isn't contributory to a decline in moral cohesion. Now, someone might say, well, what about the Chinese society, classical Confucianism? They don't have a a concept of a personal God, and yet that wasn't a a corrupt and degenerate society the way um, society was under Soviet Marxism. But it's important to understand that in Confucianism, you do have a thing called the heaven, or tien, which is a kind of moral absolute that I think serves, in a sense, as a God substitute. It's a kind of... um, confused apprehension of of the moral nature of God. And, and so it, it does have a strong sense of transcendent moral absolutes. It's not an example of atheism um, per se. So I, I would like to see someone do some really serious sociological study on this, and it wouldn't surprise me at all to see that societies that were dominated by a kind of strict atheism, kind of materialism, physicalism, uh, would not, in fact, be morally degenerate. In summation, Dr. Craig, moral values are objective, and the best explanation for that is God. Exactly. God, in his moral nature, is the standard of good and evil, constitutes moral values, and then his commands to us are constitutive of our moral duties of right and wrong. Dr. Craig, our question of the day, what is the difference between concrete and abstract objects? Boy, this is a great (laughs) question. I'm working on this currently in my uh, present research. I think that what defines the difference between an abstract object and a concrete object is that an abstract object is causally impotent. It cannot produce any effects. It's causally effete, as we might say. So take your typical abstract object, like the number seven or the set of natural numbers. If these things really exist, they have no impact upon anything whatsoever. The the number seven can't cause anything. And that is the difference, I think, between abstract objects and concrete objects. Uh, Concrete objects can have causal effects, even if they're isolated in space so that they never do affect anything. At least they have the power to affect things if they were to come into contact or proximity with other things. But with an abstract object, they are utterly causally effete and impotent. They, they, there's no potential there for having an effect upon anything at all. And so I think that would be the defining characteristic of what an abstract object is. For more resources like these from Dr. William Lane Craig, go to reasonablefaith.org. That's reasonablefaith.org. 